Good evening. I'm just having a little bit of a candle incident while getting ready for tonight's exclusive Salon Bibliotherapy Live, which is going to be all about stars of the Salon celebrating women, all the amazing women who have come to Damien Barr's Literary Salon over the past 15 years. Yes, would you believe it? The Salon's been going for 15 years. Now, as I started and was just getting ready, I rather brilliantly knocked over two candles. Um, people who are regular visitors to my sessions might have witnessed the many candles that I like to put around the room because um, it makes the lighting so much more atmospheric. And I am trying to create a wonderful atmosphere of literary loveliness, as you can tell. However, one of the candles just literally fell off in a somewhat exciting and dangerous fashion. Um, so I'm just trying to fix that while people join. So welcome to people who are joining. It's lovely to see you here tonight. And because it is Women's History Month this month, we thought that it would be rather appropriate and joyous to celebrate the wonderful women of today who are writing fantastic literature. Now, I hope that candle's going to stay in the right place. If anyone sees candles falling behind me or even flames beginning to lick my hair, let me know because I don't want to go up in flames if possible. So I'd like to start this evening by drinking a toast to all of you. Thanks for joining me here tonight. And also to all the literary women, the amazing writers who have appeared on Damien Barr's Literary Salon over the last decade and a half. Cheers, Damien. I wonder if you actually know the number of amazing women writers who've come to your salons. And also, some of the people that are coming, that I'm going to be talking about tonight, that I like to think are coming to join me tonight, virtually, um, but I will be discussing, have been to the Salon more than once. For instance, Maggie O'Farrell, who I'm going to be talking about in a minute. I know, decade and a half, that is pretty shocking, isn't it? And to think that it all began in Shoreditch House back in the day um, when we all had to crowd in and sit at your feet on the floor, Damien. That's how it all began. And there were hundreds of people sitting around in a really quite tiny space and listening to those incredible authors who started the first few sessions. And every time one of those authors started talking, you could hear a pin drop. There were amazing speeches and excerpts from rock, from novels by the likes of Ma Maggie O'Farrell. And A.M. Holmes, she was one of the earliest ones and she's a great favourite of mine in my memory. I know, at your feet. It's a far cry from how it was at the Savoy, which was also a completely wonderful experience in a very different way when you had a very huge and lovely stage and it was all far more um, colourful and ornate. And I am trying to channel a bit of Savoy this evening with my rather wonderful... Um, pyjama affair. I feel that this is quite Savoy. It's the kind of thing that I would flounce around in staying at the Savoy. But also there's a little bit of a hint of Shoreditch House, maybe slightly grungy vibes with my bit of a mess, let's face it, behind me. So I'm channeling all aspects of Damien's amazing literary salons, which have been such fun over the last decade and a half. And tonight I am going to be talking very much about the amazing women who have appeared at Damien Salons. And I'm going to start off with the wonderful Maggie O'Farrell because she has appeared many times. Thanks so much, Damien, for 
such lovely things that you're saying. <laughs> um, I really hope that we will be having in-person salons again soon where we can all flounce around drinking cocktails. But in the meantime, let's do it at home and share cocktails together virtually. Anyway, Maggie O'Farrell, Damien, do you know how many times she's been to your salons? I'm guessing, as, as a guest, as someone talking, it's at least seven. But let me know if you remember, if you have that fact at your fingertips. I was thinking one day it would also be really fun to do a salon trivia session where we would have such facts as how many times has Maggie O'Farrell been a guest at your salon? How many times has Jojo Moyes debuted one of her books at your salon? And how many times have people asked inappropriate questions at the wrong moment? And many more such fun, trivial facts. Maybe we can do that when we get to 20 years, which is quite a terrifying thought. Anyway, Maggie O'Farrell, she is an amazing writer who has written, I think, 17 novels. I might be wrong. Um, and she definitely premiered Hamnet at Damien Barr's Literary Salon, which is an absolutely fantastic novel, which I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. It's all about Hamlet's son, Hamnet, who we know from the start of the book died tragically young of the bubonic plague and he was the twin of Judith and this is such a wonderful beautiful fascinating book that really makes you think about William Shakespeare who actually is not hugely present in the book he's very much a distant element of the book who makes very occasional appearances and we don't really go into Shakespeare's head we don't find out the great bard's thoughts in depth. The book is much more about um, Hamlet's, sorry, Hamnet's mother and Hamlet's wife, who is a really wonderful character in this book, who is given a great sense of poetry herself, and also a wonderful sense of a mystical communion with nature, which is incredibly powerfully written. This is one of the books that I have most um, cried about and found the most tragic because it is about death. It is all about um, the impossibility of saving a boy's life but it does have fantastical, fantastic mystical qualities and Maggie O'Farrell has done an absolutely amazing job of bringing Hamnet, the son of Hamlet, to life and she spoke about the writing of this book at one of Damien's salons very beautifully and movingly. And she also, that was in 2020, I do believe, she also previously talked about her amazing memoir, which is called I Am, I Am, I Am, which is written and published in 2017. It was her eighth book at the time. Maybe I'm getting the numbers wrong on Maggie's books. She feels like she's written hundreds of books. But if that's her eighth and that was 2017, perhaps she hasn't written as many as I thought. Anyway, Maggie, whatever she writes, she's amazing. And she feels like she's written absolutely reams because all of her books have so much power and so much resonance. I am, I am, I am is a memoir that she put off writing for years and years because she never really wanted to write a memoir because she doesn't like talking about herself. And this is one of the funny and great things that you hear when you listen to her talking to Damien about the process of writing the book and why she wrote it. And that's why I love Damien Salons and podcasts because they're so good at bringing out the innermost thoughts and secrets of all these authors that we're talking about this evening. So Maggie, in her interview with Damien about I am, I am, I am, revealed how she never really wanted to write about herself because she finds the idea of writing about herself rather distasteful. But she did, in the end, feel compelled to write a book about her own experience of near-death experiences 
of which there are 17. And she writes about these in the book, which is called I Am, I Am, I Am. The title is taken from Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar, which I'm sure many of you have read and is also an absolutely brilliant book. And she describes near-death experiences, including a hemorrhage during childbirth, a miscarriage, childhood encephalitis, amoebic dysentery, and an ill-advised leap off a harbour wall into the deep as a teen. It's written in self-contained essays, but the events are recalled in flashes. It goes back and forth throughout her life. It's not written in a logical, chronological um, timeline. It is a brilliant read, partly because Maggie O'Farrell is such a fantastic novelist. She's such an amazing creative writer. And so the memoir reads like a novel, even though it is actually 17 different stories, which she tells in a kind of woven together way. Um, so initially O'Farrell avoided writing about herself, partly to protect the privacy of her loved ones, but circumstances changed and her eighth book, I Am, I Am, I Am, which is her first autobiographical work, came to her as an idea while caring for her eight-year-old daughter who has a severe immune disorder that has repeatedly required life-saving treatment. On average, her child suffers between 12 and 15 allergic reactions per year, which repeatedly require life-saving treatment. And thus, Maggie O'Farrell is frequently to be found running down the corridors of hospitals in an absolute panic for the life of her daughter. Her daughter very frequently has extreme allergic reactions to things that she eats, maybe with a trace of nuts, or if she sits near someone who's eaten nuts and so on. And it got to the point where Maggie O'Farrell's local nurses in the hospital um, greet her by name and her daughter because she comes so frequently to the hospital. But although this sounds like it would be a very um, depressing book because it's all about near-death experiences, there's something wonderful and very life-enhancing about the book which makes you feel that there's a wonderful sense of seizing life, embracing life, carpe diem, and making the most of the moment. Each chapter is named according to a part of the body the circulatory system, lungs, cranium, intestines, and so on, underlining whichever area is at the time most in danger. There are some very hair-raising moments in the book. While travelling in Chile, O'Farrell was seized from behind by a thief who possesses, sorry, presses a machete against her throat. On a flight to Hong Kong, when she's surrounded by nuns and priests, her plane suddenly plummets downwards, like the world's most unpleasant fairground ride, she says, like a dive into nothing. Um, other less dramatic events make some of these um, life-threatening ideas seem not quite so extreme, um, but she has a close call with a passing lorry, an encounter with a circus knife thrower, and a scrabble for the lock as two strangers approach her car. So they're not all absolutely life and death to the last degree, but they are pretty terrifying. And because she's such an amazing writer, each incident is absolutely brilliantly written and utterly gripping. One of the most chilling tales is in the first chapter of the book, and that's called Neck. Um, and in this chapter, O'Farrell is 18, Waiting for her exam results, she's found a job cleaning and serving food in a hotel, far away from everyone she knew. Between shifts, she decided to walk up to a nearby tarn, and she passes a man on the way up. On the way back down, he appears again, and she realises that he's been waiting her for her. There's a heart-stopping moment when, after following her down the hill and talking insistently about birds, he lifts up his binoculars and places the strap around her neck. Rather than fight or scream, O'Farrell talks her way out of the situation, taking hold of the binoculars and prattling enthusiastically about ducks. Later, 
she contacted the police, but the incident was all but laughed off. The following week, she was visited by detectives investigating the rape and murder of a 22-year-old backpacker whose body was discovered near the path where she had been walking. She had been strangled using the strap from a pair of binoculars. And if that doesn't sound like the plot of a novel, um, what does? But it's actually true. Damien is saying that he remembers interviewing Maggie about this, which was thrilling and terrifying in equal measure. I can imagine, because these stories in the book, I Am, I Am, I Am, are all absolutely keeping you on the edge of the seat, of your seat. And you're terrified for Maggie's life and also for her daughter in the final chapter when you um, hear about what happened to her and why she is p permanently on the, well, p her, why her mother is permanently concerned for her life. So it's far from a conventional memoir, which is not a surprise for a writer like Maggie O'Farrell. And as I said, it's not told chronologically, but it's a read that I would utterly recommend, as I would, of course, Hamnet which is one of my favourite novels that I read during not lockdown, all about the plague. And if you haven't read it yet, now is the time. Um, moving on, because we have so many amazing and brilliant female writers to talk about tonight, I would love to mention the wonderful Juno Dawson, who wrote the fantastic Gender Games, which is all uh, subtitled what I think it's something like I don't have it in front of me um what's wrong with the sexes from someone who has been both and Juno Dawson was born a boy and she um changed sex or is in the process still of changing sex and she writes about this in this amazing autobiographical memoir slash discussion of what gender means and it's a really helpful brilliant interesting funny read which I must say is also brilliant as an audiobook because Juno reads it herself and she does it with amazing aplomb and she's incredibly funny she starts off describing the way that it's a boy it's a girl is one of the first things that almost all of us hear when we're born when we enter the world and before our names, we have likes and dislikes before we or anyone else has any idea who we are. Um, and after at two years of age, Juno wanted to tell her mother that she was a that she was a girl, but she wasn't able to actually do that until a lot later in her life. And Juno goes through the complexities of growing up as a girl in a boy's body, um, coming out as gay, going through all the different gender issues that she went through out through her teens and into her 20s, and then beginning the journey and the process of um, going through the physical change of becoming a woman. And it's an amazing book, which I would recommend to everyone to read because it's absolutely fascinating in terms of thinking about the way that gender is discussed and described and thrust upon us. And Juno questions everything about gender in this book and does it in a highly readable, very funny and very entertaining fashion, but also making a lot of serious points at the same time. So that's another great book that was premiered, I do believe, at one of um, Damien's salons. And Juno has been a regular visitor over the years to all of Damien's salons. Um, I am leaping around with all the incredible women that have come to the salons over the years. I'm afraid they're not in chronological order because there's too many incredible women. And... With many of the salons also, there's more than one person coming on each session. Damien normally does three per evening whenever we have done a salon in Shoreditch House or at the Savoy or in the other venues indeed where 
Damien Stanley's done the salons, for instance, in Brighton um, and in New York. So over the 15 years, there have been many, many different salons with many different women. And it's very difficult to get a grip on the chronology of these. But as I said, one of these days, I'm going to have a nerdy moment when I look at all the different guests in order and get some facts and figures about them at my fingertips. So look forward to that session. Um, Marion Keys is one of the most recent visitors to Damien's Salon. Uh, she very recently did a fantastic salon with Damien, which you can find at Salon On Demand, which is very easy to access. You only have to pay a fiver and then you can actually get hold of all these salons at your fingertips and return to them as often as you like. So Marion Keys did an exclusive salon session with her new book, Again Rachel, which is the long-awaited sequel to her hugely successful and popular book, Rachel's Holiday. Um, Again Rachel is Marion's 15th novel. Her books have become beloved worldwide for their heartwarming combination of wit, love and fearless honesty depicted through down-to-earth characters that we feel we know. Rachel's Holiday, which uh, deb debuted Rachel Walsh 25 years ago, that's a terrifying thought for how long ago that was, is regarded by many fans as their favourite of Marion's novels. Since then, 25 years ago, her readers have been dying to know just what happened to Rachel and some fella named Luke Costello. So in this salon, which you can find uh, online at Salon On Demand, you will see Marion chatting away to Damien about her own writing journey and craft. And you will discover, if you watch the salon, where she got her inspiration from, how she brings humour to some of today's most important contemporary issues. So that is a really fun salon for fans of Marion Keys, of which I know there are many hundreds of thousands. And she's an absolutely fantastic interviewee who makes the whole thing incredibly fun. Marion Keys, great writer. Um, I think she's written 15 novels and they're also great to listen to. Very good therapy because Marion Keys has been through the mill herself. She's had a lot of very difficult life experiences and she's not afraid to write about them in her novels. So I really recommend them if anyone's ever feeling a bit down, read or listen to a Marion Keys novel because they'll really make you laugh and they'll also touch on lots of nerves. Alexandra Hemmingsley is another regular salon visitor who has written three fantastic books. Her most recent is Somebody to Love. She first wrote Running Like a Girl and then, and then she wrote Leap. Running Like a Girl is about the experience of learning to run, um, but it's very much a kind of autobiographical memoir describing someone who hates running, has no great love of physical fitness and slowly overcomes this and learns to love running. Then she wrote Leap, which is in a way a similar journey, but about overcoming her fear of water and her fear of swimming and realising that she wants to conquer many or various or all of her fears throughout her life. And one of these fears is a fear of water, a fear of swimming. And Leap is Alexandra Hemmingsley's description of how she overcame that and how she discovered the joys of wild swimming. And they're both brilliant reads. Then we have the fabulous Somebody to Love. And Alexandra Hemmings Hemmingsley also um, premiered all of these books at Damien Barr's Literary Salon. And I think you can get all of these podcasts online. Just go to Spotify iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from and you will be able to find all of these podcasts 
some of which are only 15 minutes long, some of which are just a little tiny snippet of a book, some of which are much longer with Damien interviewing the author in depth. Quite often there's a longish extract of a writer reading their book aloud, but they're all really great to listen to and always with unexpected insights about the author. So Alexandra, uh, Alexandra Hemmingsley wrote her book, Somebody to Love, about her own experience of her relationship with her body, which became complicated in ways which she could never have foreseen. She struggled through a hellish experience of IVF that included being mistakenly told that the baby inside her did not share her DNA, leading her to fear that the wrong embryo had been inserted. She also suffered a sexual assault on a train while pregnant that went to trial. And she also had the axis tilting experience of her husband transitioning when she was in the very early stages of motherhood. Hemmingsley found herself unwittingly married to a woman. This very shocking experience is described in her memoir, Somebody to Love. And it's a really fascinating read, or again, great to listen to on audio. Um, it's a very, it's a highly readable account. It's very generous, calm and thoughtful. Alexandra Hemmingsley describes her feelings about all of these extreme situations from IVF to being sexually assaulted, to having a very strange experience of pregnancy, and then to discovering that her husband is a woman. Um, and she then describes her ongoing relationship with her husband when he transitions to a woman and how they still have a very good and positive relationship and also have a great relationship with their child. So it is a very positive read and really interesting and beautifully written because um, Hemmingsley has written in many other forms over the years as well as her three um, autobiographical memoirs. So find that one on the Salon podcast. Another great, wonderful woman, um, one of our favourites of the Salon is Diana Athill, who I remember first meeting at Tilton House when we had a reading weekend back in the day, which I fear was at least 12 years ago, maybe even longer. And Diana Athill has an absolutely wonderful, beautiful voice. If you search out um, Diana Athill on the Literary Podcast, you will have an absolute joy of listening to Diana Athill. And not only does she have a fabulous voice, but she speaks the most beautiful language as she also writes it, because Diana Athill was an editor of other people's novels, and she was an absolutely amazing, brilliant editor who cared deeply about language and uses it on a par to nobody else. She was actually V.S. Naipaul's editor, and V.S. Naipaul is an, an amazing writer for all his faults. He does write incredibly beautifully, and I feel that Diana Athill probably influenced him to some degree, or maybe it was a mutual influence. But as users of the English language, V.S. Naipaul was an amazing one, and Diana Athill is an even more amazing one. And she's written many fabulous memoirs, which, if you haven't had the joy of reading, find one immediately and start reading it tonight. Diana Athill read from her book Somewhere Towards the End uh, in the most recent Literary Salon podcast, which I think she published... In, she died in 2019. I think it was published in 2018. And Diana Athill was remarkably old um, when she wrote this memoir. She, said, she asks, what is it like to be old? And the book is called Somewhere Towards the End. She made her reputation as a writer 
with the candour of her memoirs, her commitment, in her own words, to understand, to be aware, to touch the truth. Now in her 90s, I think she started writing it when she was 93, and freed from any inhibitions that even she may once have had, she reflects frankly on the losses and occasionally the gains that old age brings, and on the wisdom and fortitude required to face death. So this is a book that looks unflinchingly in the face of death because Diana Atthill wrote it when she was 93. She knew that she didn't necessarily have decades more to live. So she does look unflinchingly in the face of what's to come next. It's a lively narrative of, of events, lovers and friendships looking back over her life. The people and experiences that taught her to regret very little, to resist despondency and to question the beliefs and customs of her generation. So she also wrote um, various other books and novels, but mostly her memoirs are what she's most famous for. She wrote Yesterday Morning, A Very English Childhood, which looks back on her rather idyllic seeming life where she lived in a beautiful big house with horses and servants and questions whether this actually prepared her well for adulthood or not, a more realistic adulthood. Um, she also wrote Alive, Alive, O oh, and Other Things That Matter and Stet, An Editor's Life, which is a really fascinating memoir of her life as an editor in London when she was mixing with all sorts of amazing authors of her day. Um, and she also wrote another book called After a Funeral, which was about Didi, an Egyptian in exile, who killed himself, who she lived with, and it questions why he did what he did and talks about their life together. So somewhere towards the end is an absolutely wonderful book. Diana Athill, an incredible woman who came to several of Damien's salons and spoke at several of them. I also had the joy of meeting her at one of our reading weekends and she was an absolutely formidable, wonderful, amazing woman. And the way that she speaks and uses language makes you want to up your game in a major way. Let's drink a toast to Diana. May she live forever in our hearts and minds. Moving on to Tay Selassie. Another amazing woman who I remember coming to um, the Savoy with her novel Ghana Must Go, which is a stunning novel spanning generations and continents, a tale of family drama and forgiveness, um, which is about the Says, a Nigerian Ghanaian family living in the United States. They're a family prospering until the day Father and surgeon Kwaku Sai is a victim of a grave injustice. Asham, ashamed, he abandons his beautiful wife Fola and their little boys and girls, causing the family to fracture and spiral out into the world, New York, London and West Africa. They go on uncertain, troubled journeys until many years later, tragedy reunites them. Has this broken family a chance to heal or not? Ghana Must Go is a fast-moving story of one family's fortunes and an ecstatic exploration of the inner lives of its members. Tei Selassie has perfectly pitched prose and a flawless technique, and she does more than merely renew our sense of the African novel. She renews our sense of the novel, period. Um, it's an astonishing debut. That was the words of Teju Cole, who wrote Open City. So Tei Selassie, I remember very clearly coming to um, the salon because she spoke so beautifully, was absolutely wonderful to listen to and also looked absolutely incredible. Um, I wish we had films of those salons, Damien. Is that possible? Are that Would they be anywhere? Would we have films out there? Because it would be great to see some of those amazing snippets. I bet you do have some. Um, but anyway, you can definitely find all of these incredible guests on the Salon podcasts. So look up Ghana Must Go 
with Tay Selassie because that's a fantastic book. I'm just going to read you a little excerpt of it to give you a flavour. I know I can't do too much of this tonight because there's too many amazing authors to talk about. I'll just read you a little tiny section. Olu was silent, too startled to speak. You can't. Dr. Way opened his hands. QED. Your mother, for example, Ms. Savage, not Mrs., with a different last name than yours. Is that right? says Sai. I'm assuming, and it is just an assumption I acknowledge, that your father left your mother to raise you alone? Olu sat frozen, too angry to move. Exactly. And there's your example, your father. The father is always the example. He paused. Now, you may say, no, no, I'm not like my father. No, Olu mumbled. And that's what you think, but I'm just, I'm just like my father. I'm proud to be like him. Just barely a whisper through Olu's clenched teeth. Dr. Wei, caught off guard, tipped his head and looked at Olu who, hands and chest trembling, looked steadily back. Said, he's a surgeon like I am, the best in his field, and the rest in an outpour, one soft, seething rush. The problem isn't Ling wants to marry an African. It's not that she's marrying me, and she will. No, the problem is you, Dr. Y, your example. You're the example of what they don't want. Both of them, Ling and Leanne, and why is that? Why aren't there pictures of them in your place? What was it? The father is always the example. Both of your daughters prefer something else. Ling appeared now in her coat, holding Olu's. Amen. Lacrimosa, the choral climax. Dr. Y cleared his throat, but before he could speak, Ling grabbed Olu and left, out the door, just like that. So that's a little excerpt from Ghana Must Go, which I would hugely recommend. Um, I'm now probably going to have to race through many other amazing authors. I'm just going to mention Susie Boyd, who wrote My Judy Garland Life, uh, which is all about her celebrity obsession. It's written in a very self-deprecating style, and she's written several novels, such as Small Hours, but My Judy Garland Life is a um, auto a, a memoir of her obsession with Judy Garland and that is a brilliant read and also that's another great salon moment listening to her talking to Damien about her obsession with Judy Garland and why she wrote about it. Um, Rose McGowan's book Brave is another fantastic read which was also an amazing salon evening when Rose McGowan came to the Savoy and talked about her very powerful, interesting and impactful book. Um, here's a quote by her. My life, as you will read, has taken me from one cult to another. Brave is the story of how I fought my way out of these cults and reclaimed my life. I want to help you do the same. And this is a rallying cry from a very powerful, um, interesting writer with a great story to tell, Rose McGowan. It's a revealing memoir and empowering manifesto. She was born in one cult, um, which was a religious cult, and came and came of an age in another, a more visible cult, the cult of Hollywood. So it, she writes about how she was born in a religious cult and then how she became an actress and became part of Hollywood, a world where she was continually on display and stardom soon became a personal nightmare of constant exposure and sexualization. Rose escaped into the world of her mind, something she'd done as a child when she was in a real cult, in a religious cult, and into high-profile relationships. Every detail of her personal life became public, and the realities of an inherently sexist industry emerged with every script, role, public appearance and magazine cover. The Hollywood machine packaged her as a sexualized bombshell, hijacking her image and identity and marketing them for profit. Hollywood expected Rose to be silent and cooperative and to stay in the path. Instead, she rebelled and asserted her true identity and voice. She re-emerged unscripted, courageous, victorious, angry, smart, unapologetic and controversial. 
So Brave is her raw, honest, poignant memoir of that um, journey that she made. And that's another really great interview to listen to on the podcast. Um, I now must mention the wonderful Jojo Moyes. Really annoyingly, with my um, candle obsession, I spilt a huge amount of wax on this book, which somewhat spoils the beauty of the cover, which is a very lovely cover. And I just want to show you the inside as well, which is full of fireflies. And there is a really wonderful scene in this novel where the fireflies um, come to the fore. And this is a really great fabulous read all about the pack horse librarians of Kentucky. Um, it's set in the Depression years and it's all about Alice who's moved to Kentucky from England after a whirlwind marriage to the handsome and charming Bennett, son of the local mill owner. Sadly, her life in America isn't the glamorous one she'd envisaged. When the opportunity arises to become one of the country's pack horse librarians, taking library books on horseback to isolated farms in the mountains. She leaps at the chance to join this band of pioneering women. Close friendships evolve as her marriage falters. This is a story of courage and endeavour, hardship and endurance, as the women ride out each day to take books to those who need them most. Books on childcare, cooking, healthcare, adventure, romance and even sex education scandal. Um, this is a really great read which um, has many of my favourite things in it and also many of Jojo's favourite things. Books, horses, strong independent women and Jo, um, sorry Jojo in her interview with Damien said that some of these women in her story are what she wants to be when she grows up because they're so feisty, cool and go-getting. And listening to that interview is a, is a real joy, I have to say, um, listening to the seeds of the idea of where Jojo got the idea to write the book about the Pack Horse Librarians, which is based on the true story of real women that really did go out into the Kentucky landscape with books attached to the horses that they were riding and they took them to people who were illiterate, who had never had books, to kids who had never had the joy of picture books and slowly converted the, the people of that landscape to the joys of reading and became their lifeline. And there's some really fantastic scenes and stories in the book which does become a completely gripping tale and I won't go into all the details but you are completely rooting for Alice who is the heroine of the book but also for the other pack horse librarians because there's three key librarians in the story um, and it's all about their relationship with each other but also their relationship with the men in their lives it's an incredibly frustratingly sexist world but the women do prevail not to give away too much about the plot and I'm just going to read you the beginning of the book because it's such a great beginning and I was just looking at it again this morning and remembering how much I loved it and how irresistible a read it is. This is the prologue, 10, sorry 20th of December 1937. Listen, three miles deep in the forest just below Arnott's Ridge, and you're in silence so dense it's like you're wading through it. There's no birdsong past dawn, not even in high summer, and especially not now, with the chill air so thick with moisture that it stills those few leaves clinging gamely to the branches. Among the oak and hickory nothing stirs, wild animals are deep underground, soft pelts intertwined in narrow caves or hollowed out trunks. The snow is so deep the mule's legs disappear up to his hocks, and every few strides he staggers and snorts suspiciously, checking for loose flints and holes under the endless white. Only the narrow creek below moves confidently 
its clear water murmuring and bubbling over the stony bed, headed down towards an endpoint nobody around here has ever seen. Marjorie O'Hare tests her toes inside her boots, but feeling went a long time back and she winces at the thought of how they're going to hurt when they warm up again. Three pairs of wool stockings, and in this weather you might as well go bare-legged. She strokes the big mule's neck, brushing off the crystals forming on his dense coat with her heavy men's gloves. Extra food for you tonight, Charlie boy. I'm not going to do the Kentucky accent. Sorry, I just know it would sound terrible. She says and watches on his as his huge ears flick back. She shifts, adjusting the saddlebags, making sure the mule is balanced as they pick their way down towards the creek. Hot molasses in your supper. Might even have some myself. Four more miles, she thinks, wishing she'd eaten more breakfast. Past the Indian escarpment, up the yellow pine track, two more hollers. An old Nancy will appear, singing hymns as she always does, her clear, strong voice echoing through the forest as she walks, arms swinging like a child's to meet her. You don't have to walk five miles to meet me, she tells the woman every fortnight. That's our job. That's why we're on horseback. Oh, you girls do enough. She knows the real reason. Nancy, like her bedbound sister Jean, back in the tiny log cabin at Red Lick, cannot countenance even a chance that she will mix the next tranche of stories. She's 64 years old with three good teeth and a sucker for a handsome cowboy. That Mac Maguire, he makes my heart flutter like a clean sheet on a long line. She clasps her hands and lifts her eyes to heaven. The way Archer writes him, well, it's like he steps out of the pages in that book and swings me onto his horse with him. She leans forward conspiratorially. Ain't just that horse I'd be happy riding. My husband said I had quite the seat when I was a girl. I don't doubt it, Nancy, she responds every time and the woman bursts out laughing, slapping her thighs like this is the first time she'd said it. I'm realising I don't have time to give you that this whole scene. It's such a good scene, but get the book and read it if you can or listen to it. It's a really great story. And also listen to the um, literary salon when Damien's interviewing Jojo about this book because she tells you so much about how she met all these amazing characters when she went to Kentucky to do the research. She ended up staying in some amazing log cabin on a hillside which uh, where she was looked after by an amazing character who she's now really good friends with. And that lady gave her all sorts of brilliant stories and ideas for the book. And it really gets incredibly gripping very quickly. And it's a great story, which actually goes through quite a lot of pain and heartbreak, but also is a fabulous story of resilience. And Jojo Moyes, she's been a regular visitor to all of Damien Salons over the years. Uh, she also read her um, an excerpt from Me Before You many years ago. And we were lucky enough to be one of the first to hear uh, one of the chapters from that book when Jojo still thought that it might be a disaster of a book because it's all about um, somebody who, as we as we now know because of the film, somebody who um, loses all their movement from the neck down and therefore wants to kill themselves. And she thought that that would be a complete disaster potentially to sell but actually as we now know it's gone completely global and been a real su success of a film too. So Jojo has been visiting Damien Salons many times over the years. She's a fantastic writer and an amazing woman and um, let's hope that there will be more Salons soon where writers such as Jojo can appear and tell us about their new books. So that's Jojo Moyes. Miriam Margulies was another very recent visitor to the salon, um, interviewed by Damien, all about her fantastic memoir about her extraordinary life in a riotous memoir jam-packed with jaw-dropping anecdotes. It's called This Much Is True. Um, she wrote the book at the age of 80, 
and she is telling in this uh, memoir her extraordinary life story, which is far richer and stranger than any of the parts she's played as an actress. So you could also check out that interview on the Salon podcast. Um, I think that's one in that's one of the ones in Salon on Demand, and um, that's a hilarious interview that totally made me split my sides laughing. And I would also thoroughly recommend the book, which has been known to have people openly weeping with laughter on the tube. Um, a couple of other people I must mention are um, Janice Galloway, amazing author who wrote The Trick is to Keep Breathing and many other fantastic novels. She's also um, been to the salon, I think, m more than on one occasion. A.M. Holmes, who I was mentioning earlier, who wrote um, We We Will Be Forgiven, which was one of the earlier salons, also at Shoreditch House. And that is one of my favourite books about a highly um, dysfunctional family. Definitely one for you, Laughing John. Um, I know you do love a story about a dysfunctional family. Um, in fact, I think you might have already read that one. I'm sure we've talked about it. So May We Be Forgiven is an amazing novel, which I very much remember A.M. Holmes appearing at the salon and reading aloud from her book when she'd just flown over from the States and she was completely jet lagged and in a really peculiar emotional state. But she read from the book and we were all completely gripped, hanging on her every word, totally could have heard a pin drop in that room. And it was a completely extraordinary beginning of a novel in which there's an absolutely terrible car crash and everything that can possibly go wrong se seems to go wrong right at the start of the novel. And I re very much remember the discussion afterwards with uh, Damien and A.M. A. M. Holmes all about how you can start a novel like that and carry on writing an interesting story once you've had all the epic drama, the complete peak right at the beginning of the book. But A.M. Holmes does brilliantly manage that in that novel, May We Be Forgiven, which I would hugely recommend because it is actually a really compelling, interesting, powerful read, which um, is somehow a very healing book as well, because it's all about very messed up families where everyone betrays each other in various different and rather terrible ways. And then people have to remake the idea of family in new, different styles. So they start making families which are not blood families, but families that might involve adoption or friendship or unconventional relationships. And it's a great book, which uh, you should definitely read. So many amazing books to read. Um, we've also uh, had a fantastic um, salon visit from Polly Sampson, who wrote a theatre for Dreamers, which is a really lovely novel all set on a Greek island, the island of Idros, and it describes uh, one summer and various complicated interconnected relationships involving one of the heroes is Leonard Cohen and that's another really lovely read and you can also hear Polly reading an extract from that book on the salon. Um, Sarah Perry is another amazing salonista, one of the um, authors who's made more than one appearance. She wrote the fabulous The Essex Serpent, look at this very beautiful cover too, um, which is a really gorgeous book. And then she also wrote the amazing Mel Moth, which there's a really great podcast that you can listen to on the Salon um, podcast page. And Mel Moth is her third novel and the follow-up in terms of being the next novel, not a continuation of the story, to the wildly successful Essex Serpent, which draws both theme and structure 
from Charles Maturin's 1820 Gothic masterpiece, Malmoth, The Wanderer. So it's Malmoth is a kind of rewriting of um, an, an 18th century Gothic story, sorry, 19th century, 1820. And the titular figure in the original book, Malmoth, was a man, a kind of kitsch mashup of Faust and the Wandering Jew, who sold his soul to the devil in exchange for 150 years more time on earth. But um, Sarah Perry updates the tale and puts it into a modern context. Other people have updated this story as well. Balzac did. He wrote a novella called Malmoth Reconciled. And Sarah Perry transforms Malmoth into a woman and changes the myth, charging it with Christian and folkloric resonances presenting it as a series of documents purporting to prove the existence of this ghastly, tormented figure, Malmoth. So it's a really interesting and quite painful read, but it does also have very redemptive qualities. So even though it is a book about witnessing pain in a way, it's a book which talks about the importance of witnessing trauma and pain but also very much has a sense of ultimate goodness in a way being behind the pain that is witnessed. It does remind me somewhat of um, Selena Godden's Mrs Death, Mrs Death because in Selena Godden's book the author creates a new version of death personified as a black woman who goes around with a shopping trolley and is pretty much unnoticed by everyone. And Sarah Perry's book, Malmoth, is a very different kind of book, but just the way that they're both rewritten with a very um, famous, important figure um, who's normally personified as a man, they both change that figure into a woman and give it a very different kind of atmosphere because of that. And if you haven't read Melmoth, I would say it's an absolute must. And also a great interview to listen to on the podcast. Um, there's a many um, exclusive readings also on the podcast with all sorts of fabulous authors. Too many to mention now, but... For instance, just to mention a few, there's Emma Stone X, who wrote The Lighthouse, um, Joe, Joe Browning Rowe, who wrote A Terrible Kindness, um, very recently published, also a great read, The Great Godden by Meg Rosoff, which is a young adult book, um, Rachel Joyce, Dolly Alderton, so many more amazing and brilliant writers which you can discover. So I have been talking about the joys of Salon Live. There is going to be a real live salon quite soon uh, coming to a salon in Brighton on the 22nd of April. Douglas Stewart, Booker Prize winning, Booker Prize winning novelist who wrote Shoggy Bane, is sharing his follow up to Shoggy Bane, which is called Young Mungo, um, on the 22nd of April, closing his UK tour. Tickets are available um, which you can find at literarysalon.co.uk, selling fast, so go and grab one now if you can get down to Brighton uh, for the 22nd of April. And there's also going to be tickets for another exciting salon, which will also be live and in person in London. I think those tickets are going to be announced on the 27th of March. So keep your eyes peeled on the Literary Salon website and also on the Facebook page and on Instagram. Sign up to the newsletter and then you can be the first to seize those tickets because I'm sure they will sell very quickly as well. So next week on my um, Facebook page and Instagram, I'm going to be talking about hoarders in literature. Great hoarders. So I'm going to be putting on my rubber gloves and getting ready to clean out all the rubbish that's been hoarded for centuries in those novels. So do join me for that. That will be on my um, Instagram and Facebook page at Ella Bear 2. And also you can always have an um, 
in person, in depth bibliotherapy session with me. If you book that via my email, which you can easily find um, on the web. And next month on Damien Barr's Literary Salon on Facebook and Instagram, I'm going to be talking about friendship in literature, which is a rather fabulous theme, which I'm very much looking forward to. So if any of you have favourite uh, friendships in literature, do share them with me. I'd love to know your thoughts about friendship in literature. It's not something we tend to think about that often. We tend to think about romance in literature or tragedies in literature. Friendship is something that doesn't get enough airspace. So I'm going to rectify that in a month's time. So that will be the topic for April's um, Literary Salon on a Wednesday night. And we'll let you know the date if you go to the Facebook page. Uh, so on that merry note, uh, I'd like to wish you all good night and drink a toast to all the amazing female writers who have been writing fabulous books and sharing them at the Literary Salon. And also to all the incredible female writers that came before, without whom the modern um, writers would not have been able to do what they do. Let's drink to them. And on that lovely note, good night. See you very soon.